for that um, description. You're welcome. I think I'd rather be Lou Reed, though. Um, <laughs> and uh, first, I'll, I'll start by acknowledging uh, the people of this country and um, and all of you for coming tonight. Thanks very much for coming out to see what a Queensland is getting up to. Um, I guess originally my passport says I'm Victorian, but I've only been here for two years, so I don't really claim it. What I'd like to show you tonight, though, is um, just one project that I've been working on. I've just about finished. It's my own house. <coughs> I've been working on it with um, my wife, Susan, who's also an architect from Ireland. And it's... Um, it's been going on for about three, almost four years now. Um, we've just finished the insides finally. Handles are on toilet doors, all those sorts of things that we hope for. Uh, and we're about to start in uh, some of the other edges, which I'll get to at the end. Um, I think what interested me in um, this talk series Dan's put together is the um, emphasis on uh, the fabric of the building and how that might uh, give you some idea of how um, uh, an architect might operate or, or particularly what I think um, and what I'm interested in, their value of, of being an architect is in um, I me, mean, it's just the locator of style and, and what we do. Uh, I think it's very different to uh, um, this idea of fashion, uh, which tends to deal with copying a little bit more. So to start things off, um, it's probably fair to say Vitruvius had 10, Cabuzzi had 5, I've got one idea, and that's it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's located in this uh, detail. The idea is the radical centre, and it's something that's come about um, over the last six, seven years, um, working in different ways with Noel Pearson up in the Cape. Uh, the way he described it is the, the bringing together of um, two uh, entities um, in a way that you might aim to synthesise them. And in his context, he was dealing with responsibilities and rights in, um, in Aboriginal affairs. Uh, the, the other alternative, I guess, when you bring two things together is if you don't synthesise them, is to bring them into, a, into the, uh, a state of tension so it doesn't become a hybrid, it's just a space between them that, that they're both understood. So it's that particular kind of uh, definition I'm more interested in um, architecturally because I think there's something in it, and it's something I've been looking at for, for many years um, as uh, a pure idea. As a detail, uh, and in this house, it, it, it came to this moment um, after a 30 odd attempts at trying to do it, and there's only the two significant deep, uh, materials I was playing with. One was timber, and the other was uh, concrete. And the reason those two materials exist is because the timber is, uh, I guess, the tradition of um, architectural construction in Queensland. Um, even prior to colonisation, it was, it was the material. Um, and the subsequent material has been uh, concrete and masonry. I guess the sentimental point about it. Uh, is that my grandfather on my indigenous side of the family is a carpenter and my grandfather on my Irish side uh, is a concrete up here in Collingwood, <coughs> unfortunately. Um, <laughs> so all my time is spent trying to figure out how to bring these two materials uh, together in a state of tension. Um, because if it became a hybrid, you have concrete with timber flex in it, with how I saw it. So I looked at the concrete as the thing that would become uh, I guess the thermal mass to the inside of the house and the timber that would become the skin um, or the cladding that protected this thing and protected my uh, family. In between would be its um, uh, action of separating and in between again was the space that uh, we located uh, um, insulation values and techniques as well as um, looking at how to deal with uh, the moments when it wasn't timber or masonry. So it's, it's sort of dumbest and purest um, image, that's exactly what it came down to, is that we have a uh, concrete block that was core filled, uh, laminated veneer lumber that was fixed to it, uh, aluminium sea channels that would take um, a damper on plastic sheet that could slide up and down on occasion, and um, these timber spotty gum cover strips on the outside. Out here is uh, the Queenslander, which you've probably heard various interpretations of. Um, there's one version which is quite poetic and describes it as a, um, a light and breezy kind of uh, construction with a roof 
Uh, it's a pyramid uh, in a deck in an under underfloor area. There's another type that describes it as an aesthetic, an austere one at that. Um, my interest in it is purely structural. So uh, what used to happen in this part of the country um, and, and up and down the coast is that Aboriginal people, when they passed, and some clans would be buried in the, in the fork of these trees. And some of those trees were cut down and milled and became the structure for these first houses. So for me, people, um, our old people, are literally in the structure, not in the space. So uh, it has a different reading for me. It also explains why I always paint my timber black or brown. At the end of the process, it becomes something else. So that whole frame, if you like, um, ends up being a collection of materials, um, a white set line-based render, which is supplied by Irishmen in the Irish style, and uh, tiles that are based on, on pigments that are naturally found. So I guess those two materials also help me um, get to a point where we were reasonably confident that we tuned this building up as far as we could in terms of its passive techniques. Um, Queensland, and particularly Brisbane, has a reasonably benign climate, um, maybe not politically, but certainly um, climatically. And it means that there's only a few spots where it's uncomfortable. Um, in winter, we, uh, we can get down to 10 or 12 degrees, which can be uncomfortable and you need a heater. Um, and in summer, we can sort of start to get close to 30 with uh, the associated humidity. But the techniques we were using and the modelling that we had um, completed independently was indicating we'd sort of got most of the range reasonably confident and comfortable. So um, around about now is when we occasionally turn on one gas heater and it does the whole house. Um, I must say, in some instances when we have the hot days, when the air is hot, the minute you open the house, there's nothing you can do. You can turn as many fans on, you have as much cross ventilation as you like, but it will not change the fact that the air is hot. So, uh, those days you just have to grin and bear it. So in section, um, that plan just had three moments that I had to refine, and that then informed what we could do with the rest of the house. Um, this, I guess, is again where the style for me is located, or what I think my style is. It has no, um, um, it has a secondary relationship to what the form of the house it, um, eventually took. Uh, you can see here the timber. We had had 125 millimetres between the spotted gum skin and the inside block work. There was three layers of um, insulation. We had one um, bulk insulation, all blanket here, than two radiant barriers. And uh, I guess Brisbane, if anything, suffers from overheating most year round. So the two radiant barriers, um, the first one keeps out 99% of the heat, the 1% that gets through. The second one keeps out 99% of that again. So um, it probably wasn't necessary to put the second one in, um, but there was a reason for that, and it was to do with um, we achieved 8.5 stars on the possible 10 for our BERS rating in Queensland, which is the energy um, calculations. And I really don't take failure too well, and I really wanted that 9. So I think <laughs> most people keep it at about 4 or 5. Um, and you know, it's just being a bit silly about it, I think. So it, it's a reasonably straightforward uh, detail, but there's work that goes into it to keep something simple. Everyone knows how to flash a corner, um, I think how that then comes down and plays itself out. So um, as the section moves down, um, we end up with the skin or the, the timber cladding on the outside here, which is the freshly cut um, spotted gum. The structure underneath, which is the LVL, is painted with the primed paint um, and ready to take uh, these damp lawn panels. Um, it's just giving you a sense of the uh, build-up in the um, insulation. Peter Studley, who's uh, an ex-chemical engineer located here in Melbourne, uh, did all the specification for some research into the, the insulation value. The original calculations I had were based on one sheet of air cell as a radiant barrier and a little bit of wool blanket, which um, still got us the 8.5, but once Peter got involved, the whole thing started to um, 
feel like I could go to the moon. That was good. Uh, the other thing about that cavity is that the one detail I think I think I invented two on this job, and that's it. Um, one was the sliding down one panel, and how to do it um, within a very minimal um, gap using a, a horizontal um, steel flat bar as the counterweight, so it wasn't vertical. Um, and the other was, um, which I'll show you at the end, is just down the bottom of the angle. But what it meant was that I had to uh, recalibrate the insulation in here, and it went to closed cell polystyrene and just the one layer behind the sliding panels, the radiant barrier. <coughs> These are the panels once we started to get them in. There's a preview of this angle detail I'll tell you about shortly. Um, the framing was matched to the maximum width of these downfine panels, which is 970 mils from memory. Um, they come in 1,020 sheet and you have to cut off the crimps at the end. What it meant was we could get these C channels from G James that um, would fit neatly uh, into the 45 mil wide um, LVL here, back to back, and you get two panels to slide. And I put in, in each one little um, uh, brush seals so the thing slides and glides. It's very, very neat, and it's as minimal as I can get it after four or five attempts at it. So the, the effect is immediate. Uh, on the way up and down. Um, this is Susan, um, my wife, or her husband, I should say. And um, this was the first prototype we built um, about a year before. So this went through a few, this thing went through a few iterations before it finally got it down to here. And even the LVL was oversized. That was a 65 by 150 at the time. We just kept pulling the thing down and down and getting it down to the minimum. Or maximum spans that the, uh, the structure would allow, and that then formed the entire set of that, that uh, curtain wall, if you like. Um, the other thing about that last slide is that it also allowed us to actually properly calculate um, the counterweight um, because of the composition of the, uh, the load of the sheet and in terms of weight, but also its friction against the brush seal. So it ended up being about 10 and a half, 11 kilo. We figured that out because we had two buckets of sand coming down the inside, and we just kept measuring it till um, my five-year-old could push it up. And when she hit it, then then we measured the buckets, and that was the that was the counterweight, which then had to be ten mil, and it just got higher depending on the weight calculation that I figured out. So it took a while. Um, <coughs> this little detail is. Um, but I'm excited about it because I'm from Queensland. I'm sure you guys down here have a, a masonry heritage. Look at this and think this is this is fine. Um, but we, we play with sticks, and that's what we do up in Queensland. And this angle was, uh, was just one of those magic moments for me. And it, it works in um, four different directions. So it's fixed back here into the structural slab. It overhangs the edge of the slab by 10 mil, which becomes a, a render stop coming up the outside of the building. It has. Uh, another screw that goes into um, tying those LVLs at the bottom, into the back of, raises up 50 mil, becomes a stop for the topping screw that comes up against it, and it just manages one um, detail in, in, uh, in one action. So that also took a number of drawings to get right, but it just became a really um, simple thing that allowed that to happen. So I could get through the outside and off the edge with a minimum of pass. And that's the channel coming down the stock and a little lock. What's nice about that panel and getting those four panels to work is that um, it allows these kinds of moments to happen uh, in winter, particularly when it's going to my youngest. So I guess just getting into the I guess the two materials in a bit more detail. The first one, um, the core of this thing is concrete, and concrete isn't a common material to be building with in Queensland, particularly in the centre of the city, and particularly in West End, which has a character code which works um, opposite to the borough charter. So the borough charter, if it's describing how to respect heritage <coughs> by not copying it, 
our um, local character code that says we copy it. And that's it. So the, the last argument I had with our um, city architect around what constituted the character and the styles of them was to explain that down the road we had an Italian Queenslander, we had a Greek Queenslander, a Macedonian Queenslander, and this one was an indigenous Queenslander. And that's that's when he signed off after a few months of uh, stalling. So it's nonsense, I guess, at the end of the day. But the, the nice thing about the concrete was that we couldn't even get into the side. It was the backyard of a corner corner house. It was a concrete wall that we had to bust through um, just to get onto the site. So um, that's what we did. We got through it. And as in the usual way with uh, anything that's concrete, we need to get foundations and cut into the Brisbane tough and shale that exists. The shale is reasonably easy to get through, but if you have a, uh, a cut of tough, then it's tough by name and nature. We were reasonably lucky um, one foundation had to move to, to deal with that issue. What was nice about it though was the colours that are in it. There was really rich browns and greens and yellows um, and it'll explain possibly where some of the colour palette's coming from. The style of the things from our office to date have always been to use the uh, colour palette extracted from that country or that site located in that country to give us an, an idea of the palette we'll use, um, including its opposites spectrum. Foundations, uh, lower block work, uh, slabs. Um, now the first six months of the project was uh, located around this guy Shane Norton who uh, is actually a block layer um, but had enough networks in the concrete uh, industry there in Brisbane to uh, fill me with enough confidence to proceed with this. I'd worked with him before um, when I was at Donovan Hill uh, and he was not your usual concrete up block worker. Um, so there's a guy who breaks out a bottle of bread at the end of the day, not, not uh, BBs. So he had a genuine interest and he worked on most of the Donovan Hill uh, work for the last 10 years. So he, um, he was very committed to uh, the idea of um, things being made by hand, but being planned before you put your hand on it and then finishing it off as a, as a matter of quality. Um, the other thing I had to learn very quickly was that when you pour a concrete slab, which I know you guys all know, that we don't as Queenslanders, is that you now have to start coordinating exactly where pipe works go. Electrics, all these sorts of things. Uh, when we do timber houses, it's very simple. You just cut a hole and stick it through. Uh, concrete's not so forgiving, as I found out. Uh, and it's a little bit more of a jigsaw. Uh, Steve De Pompo was uh, also part of this um, network of concreters who, in associated trades, who worked on the site for the first six months. Um, my work was generally as a labourer, uh, doing what they told me. Um, but he was in charge of all the form work and he cut everything to absolute precision and um, was uh, a great guy to have on the site. Um, I've forgotten this fellow's name, which is embarrassing because he's uh, he played for Queensland in a number of state of origins. But he was the um, he was in charge of all the concrete pumping for the whole area. And at the end of the street and down the road a little bit is uh, the Borrell uh, concrete work. So concrete and these guys were all sort of connected, and it was reasonably fresh and straight there. So uh, relative to the timber, uh, the concrete was a much closer association, but it was very much learning as we went along. Uh, and Adrian uh, Dyne, my structural engineer who I've worked with for seven, eight years now, um, who has very little hair left now after this house, which is good. Uh, Brian was out the front, he was also part of this, and this gives you a bit of an indication of what we had to deal with with the concrete and masonry works, and just the site generally. It was a reasonably steep site. Um, power lines across the top and a lot of deliveries like this which were um, slightly nerve-wracking. We did this, um, Susan and I did this as owner builders and Susan was the nominated builder. Um, so she was effectively contract managing the entire thing from beginning to end.
So the spans and walls were as required. <coughs> um, the one space where I did get an opportunity to uh, play, if you like, is uh, in the ceiling to the first wall slab, and these triangles are directly um, taken from motifs in artwork from my mother's family in the, in the islands. Um, the triangles come in around the world, but it's um, something that I used and it constructed a number of drawings, um, scaling them up and down in a way that became, uh, I guess, the, the scaling entity within that space when we got to the end of it. Um, the trick with these, obviously, is to cut them uh, with a slight bevel so you can get the things out and make sure the release agent works, which I mostly got right. see there's a lot of steel uh, with the free form that we're trying to get on the ground plane um, and then the enclosed sense of weight on top of this thing <coughs> there's a lot of cantilevering that's going on and there's a lot of columns uh, Adrian would have liked to have had in the way or in the place um, but I was only interested in two one was round and one was square So we're getting towards the end of that six months where um, the slabs have been poor, we're getting the, the first indications of the volumes that you can get. Um, the block work's been poor filled and we're just coming to the end of these guys finishing their trade and leaving the site. Let's see here the round column and the square column. And that's its primary structure as you see it. triangles up here. So what we found with these triangular forms is that the bevel could have been maybe a little bit uh, more angled and we could have used a little bit more release agent. And so the first one or two came out well and then the next 20 I had to line the back with a circular saw on a windy day only and cut upside down so the wind would blow the dust that way and we had to cut very carefully along the lines of this thing so to the concrete is no end of uh, entertainment <coughs> but it was worth it because that's what happened on the first day um, so we finally got all of them out and that night I was working into the evening and started to mess around with where we were going to put the lights exactly and how they're going to work and you get a sense now of what um, uh, the scaling can do at that time of the night, it was actually it felt like the ceiling was bending up because I've been inhaling a lot of um, paint thinners and things. So <laughs> it looked, looked a lot better than that, to be honest. But I was thrilled nonetheless. So what happens is when you don't cut straight, you don't put enough release agent in, you just get these slight chippings along the edge, which after seeing some of the core buildings, I'm not that upset about. This is reasonably uh, tight, if anything, the form works probably too tight. So. Um, it's pretty ugly once they finished. And I was standing at the front, um, the local uh, pain the ass neighbour decided to pay me a visit and inquired whether we had an architect ready to help us out. <laughs> so, um, at that point I did have a, a moment where I was um, second guessing myself but it, it passed pretty quickly because I thought if he doesn't like it I'm probably on the right path. So I would have been worried if he did like it. So the next part is when we finally got into the timber works proper. Um, there's one or two steel beams which I did the, the full drawings for and coordinated with um, the steel fabricators. And that's when uh, Dave, an old football colleague of mine, um, who was a very gifted carpenter, came on board and led all the carpentry. And he was in charge of all the primary structure of carpentry that had to go on. His uh, lining, everything was, was up to him. Um, so I took instruction from him and we had one or two uh, assistants during that stage.
And the nice thing about working on the site from that moment for me for the next six months was that as parts of the structure came down and met those angles and those little details that I was interested in, I started to get glimpses of what um, possibly could be interesting. And even then, um, I'm starting to think maybe I need to revise how the windows are going to inform that part of the plan or that part of the section. So the girls have named this the girls' column. The square one is the blocks' column. As I was saying, these were all set out based on the width of the damp one and that detail of how they slide up and down. So it was interesting, this detail could take any form ultimately, but it's, it's the final form. It um, came from another set of pressures from planning and character codes and all sorts of other things. So I'm going to use this detail again. Um, what was interesting about these LVLs is that they're, uh, uh, they're not face um, quality in terms of their finish, so they had to be um, sanded down primed and painted with this uh, to protect them before getting that final uh, coat of black paint. But it was a cheap, uh, I shouldn't say cheap, it was a cost effective option um, for us based on us having uh, to pay for this ourselves. So it's a reasonably straightforward exercise. Concrete's finished, the timber starts going, the angles go in, the timber rails go up and over and down. And that's the diagram that's in that plan. Once that's on, we're then able to start, these are the first four, they're the only four that slide up and down. Um, the rest are fixed uh, because they don't need to open uh, according to the plan. Or the ho this particular board comes out and that's so we can get to the mechanisms that these things rely on. This is the beginning of how an opening is going to work at that level. So there's no windows upstairs, it's just cutouts in the, in the cladding. This is a uh, spotted gum. It's not that curved. This is the screen. It's, um, but spotted gum is notorious up our way anyway for uh, bending and changing shape um, when you least expect it. These, these boards were 100 and 130 by 19 mil, which in terms of its slenderness ratio is about the correct size before they start to cup in that direction. So um, we could have pulled it down a little bit more, but it's it's bearing fine at the peak. Uh, it's pretty good at the moment. There's one board that's tended to cup a little bit, but um, one out of a um, number of pieces isn't a bad thing. The other thing with a spotted gum is uh, because these come from plantation forests, they're reasonably green, um, even the ones that uh, are sold to are seasoned, and they're full of tannin and they're, they're natural oil. So you can't do anything to that spotted gum until it's emptied itself of its tannin, which takes about six months. And ideally, you get uh, the stain or the paint or the coat, whatever it is you like, onto it uh, in between that six months to, to 12 months period. So. Once we had the gratification of seeing this cladding on, we then had to watch it get dirtier and dirtier and greyer and sort of um, lose that crispness that I guess it had when we started. That's it on the front. You can see it here starting to really grey off and, and you want to stop it before it goes jet black because that's, that's not good. The cell's starting to pull apart or die. Well, this is just before we decided, yep, that felt like about the right time. Um, and we could have um, stayed with the romantic story that would allow this thing to weather in grey. Um, we did that, uh, we probably have 10 years on the life of that cladding before we could sort of do it. So um, we sort of, Susan and I committed to maintaining this on a five yearly basis. So what it ended up taking is uh, a woodsman stain, which, um, depending on its orientation, you can get a minimum of three years and a maximum of five years out of it. And we've understood that, and that's that's fine. We're going to do that in the case of that. Um, the alternative was to paint it off, in which case you'd use a pine and use the standard paint and repaint every 10 years. Um, coming back for a one-year, maybe two-year gain would be to oil it. Um, that 
that's, that's, that's heavy duty sort of maintenance. So um, we wanted to be able to see the material um, and know that it's timber, but I wasn't necessarily that excited about trying to preserve it in its natural condition. So. So what happens is that they're the two rolls, uh, concrete's inside this thing, uh, the spider gums on the outside, and then there's moments where you don't have either, or you just have the, the structure of one, which is the timber. And that's when it becomes about light. So the idea of this radical sand is if you have these two things in the center has to be the void, or it has to be the condition of light. It can't be occupied by um, something that's uh, competing with the other two uh, materials. So for me it was a damp one, it was the material that we could get in up to 10 metre lengths, um, which meant it could do uh, double height spaces that I needed it to throw light into. Um, it could do floor to ceiling without any problems. And it, uh, uh, it's made in Israel and it's bomb proof, which I thought was useful. <laughs> so those drawings just pry with, of the internal court. And what happens upstairs in this thing is that all the light um, enters through the, uh, the internal drum. The light, there's no windows. Otherwise, and it just uh, does that because we're overlooked heavily by neighbours being in the backyard of the house. Um, so once the steel frame was in, we were able to like start getting a sense that the, that polycarbonate is going from the concrete to the timber, the timber roof, timber wood. You get a sense of what light's starting to do on this thing. Sixty mil CHS with a little forty mil flat well to the outside is enough to manage the, uh, the number of angles turning around this thing and get the uh, damp on to sit in neatly to it using C channels. There's a reasonably neat detail for that. And it got us to that hole. The same thing, the rule upstairs effectively is uh, anything that opens like that is just the material that it's part of being a window. So, what happens internally, um, to better illustrate it later, is that you get. Um, I guess what effectively reads is a light box in the upstairs plan, and that's the thing that throws light into both um, bedroom studios, as well as the landing at the top of the stair. And it catches, uh, catches uh, sunsets in a particularly beautiful way, so the material itself just reflects whatever's going on with the light outside. <coughs> so, what happens on the north, or the street elevation, is that the damp one comes to the outside, so uh, as it does on the, uh, the garden side to the north. Um, there's a kitchen space, which is double height. There's a front door located in the middle of this, and this is the balcony, which sits above like the studio, the girls' room. It had slightly different detailing at the top, but everything came together very simply with aluminium angles and channels. Um, and work neatly into the, uh, the drip lines that I needed of the uh, spotted gum cladding. It turned out really reasonably kind of, um, I think savage is the right word, but it's certainly um, pretty direct. You're either in, out, one cladding or the other, and there's a drip line to meet the other two. If you're not outside, you're inside. And this is the only space uh, you get to see the mountain from at that level. the cladding to the front. And at night, I guess it does the, uh, the interesting thing of giving you a sense of what's behind it. So to the garden side, or to the north, uh, it's a similar um, 
edge condition with all damp wire. So the side, this side of the house is, uh, um, receives its light from the north. They're the ones that open up. These are the fixed ones. There's nothing here. There's a laundry in there. And on its way to the, uh, the studio at the front here. So we got to the final panels in that front elevation, it's the, uh, the kitchens, but it allowed us to get this beautiful um, height and volume into that space and it's cranked slightly to the west so when the sun's setting you get refra refracted light hitting the edge of this and it pumps and pushes around this space, it's just a, a nice thing. I think it's a quality uh, particular to that damp line. So the next uh, thing after those materials, I guess, is um, I guess the finishings that are starting to be applied. Um, as I said, part of my heritage is Irish, uh, and Susan's is absolutely Irish, and uh, all of these guys here are Irish, um, and the finish that's going on is Irish. So um, what it is, is is just a cement render that went onto the, the block work, and then it gets covered in a, a line based which is called white set. And the Irish have a particular way about doing these things. So um, there's a technique to it that involves using the right hand and the left and drinking at lunchtime. So <laughs> these are hard guys to work with, um, but enjoyable at the same time. So um, they're quite amazing guys to watch. I've never really noticed it. It's a wet trade, which I wouldn't be used to in Queensland. So it's not really part of the the tradition of building there, um, coming from timber. Um, you get a sense here when it applies itself, it's, it has like an eggshell sort of texture and finish to it. It's quite beautiful um, and we're pretty adamant we weren't using plasterboard. So, um, do, do they polish it? You can do two things. As a, you need to put a, a <coughs> raw paint on or you put a, a wax on. And mm -hmm. they don't polish it, they just they give it a light sand. Okay. And sanding blocks, and it just it retains this. Yeah, it's like eggshell. It's a really beautiful sort of texture. So, um, a high risk. In, I've seen Indian ones do it where they're actually twenty people polishing. Keep, keep on polishing. Not this similar. There was mm -hmm. five or six of them going at it, like one guy going and they're coming behind, cleaning mm -hmm. the thing up. Um, but that was more in the application rather than the, the finishing. The finishing. That's when they use one hand. But you can see um, it's uh, obvious opposite right here. The square column I mentioned before, which now has our family tree stenciled onto it, um, and heights and all those sorts of things. Um, that's as it looks before it takes this room. So I guess the consequence, if you like, of um, framing this project as a matter of black and white, what life tends to be, um, and its material is that we end up not having trims, and it's just something I wanted to do was not have trims, not have glass, not have plasterboard, to see if we could do it. Um, not that unusual. A lot of the projects I've worked on in communities in New South Wales and Queensland um, would not be dissimilar in a way. There's no trims, you don't end up with architraves on doors. Your details are two things slam into each other. There's no cornices, it's just the express frame of the, the ceiling. No cornices again. Render hitting the concrete, the timber hitting the render, the concrete hitting the render. Uh, that's just a little bit of foam, just to allow the concrete to, to push up against the, uh, the block work after we poured it. Uh, 
that's its trim if you like. And a trick uh, I picked up from uh, seeing a building by um, Michael Markham, which is using the, the plaster if you like, is a treating as a surface and a line. So this angle is a small homage to that project at Bansdale. So at this point of the project, um, Dave the carpenter um, went from being in front of me to beside me and then to behind me. So these doors we made together and we went to the local timber yard and found a whole uh, stock of <coughs> nice looking timber in the corner and found out it was the thing called pencil cedar from the Cape York, um, which is code for um, no one should ask any more questions about it. And what we found is a back order that had been sitting there for some years and they couldn't get rid of it. So they did us a deal and dressed it. And what started off as maybe 45 mil thick came to us dressed as 30 mil. They had slight bows in them, um, which is a tr bit of a problem because I had calculated there was enough to make these uh, five sliding doors. Now the trick about a 30 mil wide door is that 30 mil is not wide enough to need 40 and get away to 35, 40 is better. Um, and what it meant was to get the depth we need or the width, we had to notch them into each other. So that's 20, that's 20, that gives us 40. We need 40 to get the mechanisms into the thing, which I found out the hard way. Um, the other thing is that we had to stiffen them in the other direction to stop things um, going in two directions. So they got these sort of stiffening push plates. Um, and that was a fantastic exercise in itself. The other thing is that I needed whatever went in there not to be glass. And the good thing about the Perspex is that it can work in compression, which glass can't. You can screw fix it. Um, we cut it down so it just ran flush with this and took it to its edge so it almost had a face fixed glazing detail that I've drawn a thousand times and built a few times as well uh, to do the help I did. So it came together as its own thing as we found the material. So the tool design that, not the other way around. Um, and it was a, it's kind of an exciting thing to get to the end of and go, yeah, the thing works. It was a bit crazy. That's the static screw fix detail. And the great thing about this acrylic, at least the Perspex product, is that it's um, UV resistant, so in the, the hot Queensland sun, it doesn't discolour or tint off. So that some of the cheaper ones will uh, give you that yellowing colour after a while. Um, but this, for all intents and purposes, reads the glass until you walk into it. Nice thing about those stiffening rails, which is accidental, is when they do come together, you get this kind of uh, uh, sense of a blade running through the, through the plane. So like when, it, when it stacks back, it, it starts to. Um, fall into, I guess, the, the finish of the plywood um, joinery that stay in the same colour as it and the, the spotty gum cladding on the outside of the house. So it's just stacked up in here. This little space takes you into a um, well-stocked but poorly chosen um, cellar under the stair. And all of this plywood, is, uh, the shape of these things were determined by what we could get from um, Sharps, which is a plywood supplier. And they had a background of plywood sheets that was um, ANC grade. And they were an unusual run, of, um, 700 mil. So that's what we used to maximise how we could detail the scale and form of that, uh, that entire wall of joinery. We ended up trimming it off a little bit just to get the right proportions. Um, but I still think the material decided that decision as well. Um, so I say so, that kind of opening I guess is um, just these windows and, and the final finishings <coughs> that sealed the house up. Uh, again, this ended up being a timber exercise based on what was left in terms of the material, what we could do. It's a single skin timber frame, LBLs, last bits of spotted gum. This takes you into a, um, 
a small self-contained studio, uh, which is currently the office. It's previously been the TV room. And part of that um, was the accommodation for six visiting speakers for a lecture series that ran. Uh, the same materials used in a different way. These uh, windows, if you like, that are, I'll show you quickly, um, like I said, they're part of whatever the material that I've cut them out from. Um, and they use the same system. Um, and they're quite rough, but they work in a precise manner for, for what I need them to do. <coughs> the shutters upstairs, with uh, that cladding from the outside area. Um, this orange is a naturally uh, dyed orange tile. So if I design a bathroom or a kitchen for you, um, be prepared for this sort of action. So. The great thing about making the decision to keep the cladding as the opening device is that when it's open, it's open, and when it's closed, it's closed. There's no, uh, there's no mistake that you're um, handling the, the upstairs cladding. The next thing um, was uh, an acquaintance of mine, a, an artist, uh, Niels van Amsterdam, who um, is a painter by trade, he's in the paint buildings and things. Uh, he's also uh, a sculptor, uh, a sculptor and an uh, incredible artist in his own right. And he had taken to this idea of the plastic being the thing about light and came over one day with all these uh, polypropylene sheets and thought, oh, do you mind if I make these light shades for your house? Um, and off he went. He's fantastic. He's, he's in his early 60s and every year he gives me his business card and it's a Dulux uh, colour card with the number of that colour. So it just changes in colour every year you get a card from it. So I think we're up to the blues at the moment. But he took this on board and made these and we, uh, we've worked together before and we just see what happens. Uh, what was nice about this material is that that's probably showing eye burn there, but it, they just glow and the, the polypropylene has that nice quality that you can look straight at the light and um, and it, it doesn't hurt your eyes, it just it just throws a nice glow into a space. He originally made four or five of these, all different shapes and sizes, and he made me get up and um, suspend every single one of them until he was happy with what he saw. And he would do them at the most inopportune times. He'd be having breakfast, he'd be having dinner with people, and he would just turn up and um, just have to do it. That was how it works. <laughs> and this is the one he made for the girls on the girls' column. It's <coughs> the one source of light in that, in that space. Um, Almost to the end, but the, the next thing I think which is, um, I guess, concerned with the idea of style is um, not just the plan, but I think where the kitchen is. Uh, for me, the kitchen, and I realise I've done this with pretty much everything we've worked on, has always been beside the street. So where you cook, where you peel an onion, uh, cut a potato, you're looking down onto the street. And the reason for that is because when I finally appeared to Myers, came up from the University of Sydney and took our final year at the University of Queensland and took a bunch of us down to Sydney and took us to the public housing near the Story Bridge on the south side of the bridge and showed us all this amazing housing where the, um, the kitchens were facing onto the street and the amount of um, surveillance and interaction that generated was something that stuck in my mind and when I went home to the islands I noticed not a dissimilar thing um, except the kitchens in those houses were embedded in the plan, but the, uh, there was all the cooking that would happen out on the street, literally by the beach, and it's something that stuck with me for quite some time. And it's something I had a fantastic argument with uh, the city architect and planner around, because their version of interacting with the street um, is aesthetic, so you put a veranda on there, and it doesn't work. So I'm very happy with this. Um, the other thing that I'm happy about it is because um, it's the direct diagram of uh, Susan's family's kitchen from her, um, her country house uh, at an hour north of Dublin. 
and it's laid out diagrammatically in the same way. The storage at this end, you prepare by a sink here, you cook here, you clean up here, and it goes into the dishwasher at the end. And the shelving above is just purely up there for the storage of things. So you start here and move that way. And the other great thing about it, as all country kitchens are, is that it's not about the kitchen, it's about the table, and uh, about the moment that people sitting around the table having these conversations. So that's what this is all geared around. Um, the great thing about this as well is when you are standing here, cutting that potato, as we do a lot in an Irish household, you're looking straight through onto the street here. But when you're sitting at this table, uh, you're looking straight into a garden. Amongst other things. It's obviously a busy after school day. <coughs> The other thing that's neat um, occasionally is because that thing faces to the southwest, when these storms come in for us from that direction, this is what you get to see. So you get to have this window straight up into the, the eye of the storm, um, which was intended. And very early on the table in the garden. So this gets us to the end. Where we're at right now is that we're about to construct this moment here. And um, there's no real living space as such in the plan. We've got sort of three sitting spaces, which we'll see shortly. But this is the last one, and its purpose is to have a fire, sit with a few friends here and have a few beers, and that, that's its main purpose. The other thing is that it's oriented in that way because there's a mountain that, sorry, that way um, over here. That's Mount Cooper. Um, that's the city. That's the Gather Cricket Ground. That's the river. This is West End. And the whole South Bank precinct here. So uh, I think that's about a cool. Uh, it's about a maybe half hour walk from there to here. Is that time? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what you see straight across here. So. Part of this thing we'll have to figure out how to deal with the moment um, if this thing ever gets bigger and we lose it, or whether it just becomes a mecca situation that we know it's over there and we keep facing it anyway. <laughs> and that's a small preview of the fire which we've got going again. So, um, farmer's plough disc. Um, and there's two good seasons of offcuts from the spotted gun that have gone through it. So this actually is finishing off. I'm going to run through the plans very fast to give you a sense of this thing. I don't think necessarily this, this is more indicative of the form rather than the style, I think, because the form, as I said, has come, back, come about more from um, maximising what the planners, what that argument with the planners would allow us to do. So on the ground, uh, street level, if you like, is a garage, 22,000 litre water tank, um, and a workshop down this edge, and it's bound by concrete and render only. The second level is bound, it's just, um, it's like it's damp on. This is where we eat, we cook, and sit, sit out here, sit out here as well. So, so uh, there is a separation between here and here. Um, this is a studio which takes all manner of uh, occupation. So when you come through the top of this thing, that's what you hit with. There's a front door that opens your back outside um, and pulls you around into this first sitting space across the courtyard. That's the courtyard proper. The second one out there. That's where you just come through. This sense of looking back towards that kitchen. Coming up the section, this just maximizes, that's our available uh, 
planning restriction of the lot. So the form of the city is determined, the form of the, the building is determined by the program of the city actually in terms of its uh, codes. To the top of the stair. Turning back, there's one light well from the top and that throws light into a small bathroom here and another bathroom behind it. So the night light for the girls in the evening. The central light box it turns into the girls' studio room. So this is in my bedroom. That's a really nice thing to wake up to. Um, and another idea uh, of I'd like to say borrowed, but I think it's been stolen from um, the house Mark and did over at Hawthorne. Oh, Jared, he sent me over to write something about years ago. And it stuck in my head that you would wake up beside a dreamy light quality like this. It's the burnt orange tiles to a small ensuite. And the burnt brown tiles here. So, just a absolutely finish off. This idea of um, the radical centre and these two things opposing and the idea that light's the, the thing between um, takes its most precise form in this final artwork from a, my first client, a woman called Fiona Foley. This is her last down payment on a project I did for her which I um, designed and built with uh, Lachlan Nielsen, another guy in the office. Um, and there's a hundred uh, Bodhi leaves on that wall in the entry. I cut out a four millimeter clear anodized aluminium sheet. And that's what she delivered to me. Um, she sat over my shoulder and made me do that drawing, the exact placement. Um, you know, to put the, the aluminium rods to the back, uh, fix those, put up the scaffolding, put a masonry hammer drill, drill a hundred holes, put the grid on. The whole time she's sitting down there having a cup of tea telling me all sorts of things. If any of you have met Fiona Foley, she's only this high, but she's, um, she's a force to be reckoned with. She's a uh, very strong um, Aboriginal woman. Um, and the first ones go in, and she tells me to take them out and reset them. So if there, was a, there was a couple of days of this, and by the end, I was, I was very close to killing her. <laughs> this is the effect once we get there. She's done, this is her new motif, and she, the reason she's using these, using these Bodhi leaves is that um, it's the leaves off the Bodhi tree, which put a found enlightenment under. Um, and the one she'd been using before that was a, um, a poppy um, flower, which was uh, a reference to the um, um, uh, the laws that bound um, uh, what the fact called the drug opium, opium and um, Aboriginal people in Queensland. So she's very subversive in the things she she does, and that's the effect. I like the idea that um, enlightenment is the thing that should fall out of the way of the side. So I want this place to be remembered. Thanks.